Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you. Uh, welcome to tonight's Planning and Development Control Committee. Uh, my name is Councillor Omid Miri. I'm the chair of the committee. Um, I'd just like to remind participants of a few housekeeping points before we begin. Uh, the fire exit is towards the back um, in the lift lobby and down the stairs, and there are no fire alarm tests scheduled for tonight. Uh, toilets are also at the back in the lift lobby, and a hearing loop is available for those who need it. And of course, this meeting is being live streamed. So I now move to item one on the agenda, which is apologies for absence. And we do have uh, one apology, which is from Councillor Rebecca Harvey, if that could please be recorded. Thank you. And I don't, I see we don't have any others. So we move on to item two, which is declaration of interests. Are there any declarations of interest? No. Okay, no declarations of interest. Uh, that brings us to item three, which is uh, minutes of the meeting held on 11th of October 2022. Are the minutes of the previous meeting agreed? Okay. On the declarations of interest uh, for the Earl's Court site, I declared that I was brought up adjacent to the site, not on the site, so there was no direct uh, link. If that change could be noted, I'd be grateful. Okay, thank you very much for clarifying. If that, if that can be recorded and, and noted. Um, are there any other sort of uh, matters arising from the minutes? No? Okay, all agreed. Great, so now we move on to item four on the agenda, which is one to two Solden Road. And can I ask the presenting officer, Neil Egerton, to please introduce the report. Uh, thank you, Chair. Sorry about that. Uh, this application relates to 1 and 2 Soldon Road, London W14. Um, the proposal is for the excavation of part of the rear garden to form a light well in connection with the creation of a new basement with internal swimming pool, election of a glazed, glazed structure to the rear of the house to house an internal staircase providing access between ground and basement levels and installation of intake and exhaust grills. The, uh, the site is shown highlighted in red there. It comprises two houses that were, have been amalgamated into one dwelling back in 2006 on the northeast side of Solden Road within the Brook Green Conservation Area. I have some aerial views now just to uh, highlight the site, which is here. Uh, then again, this, this is the view towards the north, towards the northeast, uh, the application property of these two houses here. And again, view, view facing northwest. And then this is the rear elevation of the property or facing southwest. So here. Uh, this is the rear, the rear elevation of the property as existing at the moment. There's a glazed extension here. There's a timber deck uh, extending out into the garden. And uh, then the rear garden towards, towards the uh, north with the trees planted. Uh, this uh, this uh, photograph indicates a previous plunge pool that is adjacent to the north west boundary of the property. Uh, it's covered over by the decking. And then if you have the, the plans here, indicates the proposed basin, which is under the, under the existing decking and then protrudes out into the, under the Greer Garden, set back from the boundaries here and here. And the basement then also goes under the 
part of the existing house. Uh, here we can see at basement level, the proposed swimming pool, a sort of leisure area, plant room, store and shower, and the stairs down uh, here towards the bottom of the spring. Again, this shows the, the proposed lower ground floor plan. So this, this is the existing terrace or decking that is there. Uh, the light well created there above and the, so the basement extends partly out into the garden and the stairs down again at this end of the property. Uh, this shows the existing and proposed rear elevation. Um, so there's very, very little change in terms of the elevation, although say on this, this, sorry, this side here, uh, here we have the, sorry, it's not working well on my screen, bear with me a second. All right. Here, this would be the glazed uh, structure that covers the staircase going down. And again, here we have a proposed section through showing, showing the basement, the pool level and the staircase. Again, further section just indicating that, uh, so I show the basement under the decking and then going under the rear garden here. And again, partly under the, the main building. It's the proposed and existing western elevation. See the, this would be where the uh, structure was to, for the stairs, same height as the existing, existing wall. And here we have an, an image of the proposal. We have the existing decking here, the light well created, and then this is the glazed structure that will house the staircase access which as you can see is below the height of the boundary wall. Um, this, this image, I mean, part of, the, part of the proposal is obviously in order to try and minimize the disruption to the neighboring properties while the work's going on. It's proposed that they would have a temporary structure covering the majority of the rear garden area to try and keep noise and dust levels down as a temporary measure during the works. And again, out here showing the street in terms of the impact here, there'd be three parking spaces outside the site that would be uh, suspended in order to allow deliveries to the site. And then there is also a parking space here at the end of Solden Road and one just on the corner of Ainho Road that would be suspended on various measures to allow maneuvering of the larger vehicles towards the site during the, during the process. The applicants are also showing that there will be a covered walkway here to allow pedestrian access across the site whilst the works are going on um, in order to make things easier for the pedestrians. So the main considerations, the, the basement complies with policy. The design is no, considered there's no detrimental impact on the conservation area. Above ground level, it's a fairly small scale development. There'd be no harm to daylight and sunlight or outlook or privacy for the neighboring properties. Noise um, during construction periods. Um, our environmental colleagues have reviewed the construction management plan are satisfied with that, as are our transport colleagues. Again, with traffic and congestion matters, um, a construction logistics plan, the draft one has been submitted. And then there's condition attached requiring a an updated document be provided prior to the development commencing. That would be a live document that can be amended during the, the process. So the basement complies with policy DC 11. And the applicants have submitted a construction method statement outlining how the works will be carried out and how the structural matters will be uh, protected of the properties. Officers are, rec officers are recommending approval for the development. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, now I'd like to invite um, Paul Custers to speak in support of the application. And uh, Paul, you have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Ah, okay. Good evening. Building a basement is something that often causes anxiety amongst neighbors. Accordingly, the council has given a great deal of thought to the preparation of the supplementary planning document for basements to allay any concerns. This document sets out the council's criteria for basement projects and the supporting studies required to show in detail how particular issues have been addressed both during and post construction. We have done everything possible to satisfy all these criteria and have engaged with the specialists within the various departments of the council to ensure that the project complies with every policy and requirement. We greatly appreciate the contribution of the council staff, which has been particularly helpful in getting us to this stage. This process has covered the extent, form, depth and location of the proposed structure the issues surrounding the traffic generated during the construction process and the implications on nuisance and acoustic levels during and post construction. Thought has been given to the construction process itself, and this will be further refined once a contractor is appointed. There were many objections received but we believe that the project as now submitted deals with these various objections in that one, it is not out of keeping with the conservation area and nor does it represent overdevelopment. There is no change to the street appearance at all and thus no impact on the street scene. And on the garden side, the impact is restricted to changing a small part of the existing deck into a glass box extending no higher than the existing boundary structure to house the staircase. To the construction method proposed to form the shell, namely augured piles, presents no material risk to surrounding properties or indeed the host residence itself. A basement of this scale presents no risk to groundwater levels. Three, post completion, there will be no perceptible noise or smell generated by the pool. Four, while, the, while there will, in common with all construction projects, be additional traffic, the traffic management plan forming part of the application has comprehensively dealt with all the issues identified. We draw attention to several other approved projects also overlooking the gardens at the rear of the properties. We believe that the noise and disruption generated by these will be greater than that generated by this basement project as they all take place above ground level. And lastly, the owners and their children will continue to live in their house during the works, which affirms their belief that any disruption will be minimal. We submit that there is no good reason to refuse planning consent and ask that you favorably consider our request to grant this. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you for your time. So we now move on to uh, committee members' questions to officers for clarification. Um, I'd like to begin the questioning um, just to come on something that, that Paul mentioned in his, um, uh, in, in his uh, comments. Um, I, I noted that some of the objections or some of the concerns from neighbors were to do with risk of subsidence. And uh, I'd be interested to learn more about what measures are being put in place to prevent that from happening. Uh, so the applicant has submitted a construction method statement um, as required by the policy. And this sort of sets out the proposal, how, how, the, how the work should be carried out in terms of structural matters. I mean, officers um, have, you know, reviewed this submission and we have no reason to question the conclusions of the report. I mean, it's a matter that will be dealt with under the building regulations if, if permission is granted and if the development is implemented. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Okay, are there any other questions? Yep, yeah. uh, Councillor Harcourt. Thank you very much, Chair. I'll be fairly brief, just a couple of quickies. Um, it may be in the report somewhere. What's the actual size of the swimming pool? The, sorry, the pool, I'd say, is about 1.1 metres deep. It is, uh, sorry, I have. Nine point seven meters wide, uh, sorry, wide, and in terms of depth, it is around about uh, two point eight meters. So, uh, yeah, it's about twenty eight thirty square meters. I think the pool. Okay, thanks very much. Just um, one further question. Um, um, we've heard about uh, just been hearing from the speaker about noise. If you go into most uh, swimming baths, there's a lot of noise reflected. What's been done in terms of uh, mitigation to stop any noise from, you know, being reflected out beyond the um, boundaries? I mean, the, the swimming pool is enclosed within within the building, underneath underneath existing decking and the garden. There is no real the the glass um, for the the light well is not openable. So there will be very little opportunity for any noise breakout from that. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Just coming on from that, actually. So uh, do any of the neighbouring properties have basements? Um, not that I'm aware of, though. Okay, so the basement won't be, won't have any adjoining walls? I don't believe so, no. It's, okay. it's the, build, the basement is pulled back from the boundaries with the neighbouring properties where it goes beyond the... Um, existing building. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor Carmel. Thank you. If I, if I could start, it wasn't where I was going to start, but uh, since Councillor Harcourt raised it, uh, noise leakage. Uh, paragraph 5.32 of the report says that there's going to be a breach of our usual standards. Is that correct? Yes or no? So 5.32, 5 yes, the acoustic report by the, that was submitted at this stage, the initial report, as it says here, um, indicates that those background sound level be 28 decibels, and the estimates of the noise from the plant um, indicate it should be 19 decibels, which is obviously what we would normally look for it to be 10 decibels below. This is one decibel above, on this um, um, initial document. I mean, we certainly the advice from our special officers is um, the residual noise impact of one decibel would not really be audible or understandable. However, we have had the condition to get a post installation noise assessment, which would allow, which obviously at the moment it's very much a, an estimate or a paper. A paper project to estimate the noise. So once, yes, um, I, 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 I understand all of that. At what stage? Because it is just an estimate. And mm -hmm. call 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 me a cynic, based on long history. That uh, uh, nearly every estimate that I've come across from a developer, be it a householder or a major building application, always tends to be a lowball figure. At what stage uh, would enforcement action be taken? I'm just out of interest. What, what, is, uh, what would be the level at which you would say that you either replace the pumps or mm -hmm. whatever, uh, or improve the sound insulation um, to yep. ensure that the neighbor's uh, residential amenity is not adversely affected? I'm, I'm just interested at what sort of leeway uh, would be given. Um, we, I would have to, we would consult with our colleagues in the noise protection team on those, on that issue. I mean, the post installation report will allow a much more definite, definitive um, answer about the noise levels and that would allow additional steps to be taken to ensure compliance with the standards. Thank you. So I didn't really get, um, and I, I, I noticed that the, uh, the 
the uh, another piece of non-compliance is the debt where our policy says 3.5 meters and this is listed in the report as being marginally exceeded um is it not correct that the uh, exceedance is 15% give or take which is slightly more than marginal when does when when does an exceedance at what percentage level does something cease to be marginal i mean we we would we would make a judgment on the individual case i mean if we look at the plan the relates to i suppose the the glazed housing for the staircase which comes i think it's 0.6 for me to further than the standard of you know but then that is a very narrow 1.5 meter extension that would have very little little impact on anyone the there's also a significant dis amount of the garden space left so i think officers consider on balance that whilst that does technically breach that it would not be something that would warrant refusing permission on. I'm, I'm not particularly bothered about the the exceedance in this case what i am interested in is the policy of planning officers as to when an exceedance ceases to be marginal i mean i think 15 percent is uh, rather more than marginal you know anything over five percent i would say was more than marginal i just wondered if there was a policy or whether you just do it on a case-by-case -case basis oh i mean all, as you as you're aware all applications are considered on their merits if this was a a much if this was a much wider if this was a much wider extension then the the exceedance may warrant a different position but given the the narrowness and it's you know reduced uh, the reduced width we can one, one last point if, I, if 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 i may um i had a look through the conditions um i noticed that there isn't a condition uh limiting the hours of work is that included in the ctmp yeah, the construction management plan would include the standard um, hours of hours of working. Yep. In in which case, I, I always, as, as members of this committee know, I often uh, amend the standard conditions to include no working on a bank holiday because our standard conditions, unlike virtually every other council's uh, uh, standard conditions, don't include bank holiday, no working on bank holidays. It's you know, Monday to Friday, the set hours, Saturday morning till one and not on Sundays, but it doesn't exclude bank holidays. Uh, can, we, can we agree to uh, amend uh, the agreed CTMP to include no working on bank holidays, especially as, you know, digging does create noise? We've done it before. Yeah, I mean, we, if it includes it, we can amend that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Councillor Chavot Verdier. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a question about what was raised by residents on the topic of privacy. Um, you showed us a, um, a proposed sheet that you described as um, a fully sheeted and roofed temporary structure in the report. Um, I was interested in knowing, yeah, if you actually go back to the slide, it'd be great. I'd be interested, thank you, in knowing how much taller is it than the existing wall? Sorry, exceeds exceeds the fence by around about ninety centimeters. Um, you know, whilst you know we wouldn't want to encourage a permanent structure in that respect because because of the 
because of it's there to try and reduce the uh, impact on the neighbours, officers consider that as a reasonable mitigation for some of the works. Yep, thank you. And the question then is, um, some residents raised the possibility of workers on looking into their houses, but the way I see this on the screen, it's fully enclosed. So unless workers are working on, on, on top of it, which I don't imagine will happen, will workers have any view or sight into other people's homes? Um, I, don't, I don't believe that is the case. I mean, it's, it is an unusual situation, obviously, normally with a lot of development, you wouldn't have a structure like that and workers would have views all the time. So, I mean, I think in terms of restricting views from worker, for workers, keeping noise and dust down, that, you know, seems to be a reasonable proposition. Thank you. Uh, another question I had was about the parking. And so we've seen that some of the parking space at the angles will be removed or suspended to allow for turning of vehicles and the, the parking in front. Um, as I'm guessing, this won't be during the entire length of the construction. Um, what will be put in place to inform residents of when exactly that will be suspended? And, and if there are periods during which there is a suspension and then not a suspension and a resuspension, how would we address that? I mean, the, the suspension of the parking spaces, they would have to apply to our highways team or the network management team. I believe that the spaces immediately outside the site would probably be needed for the entire development um, to allow all the deliveries, both small and large. The, the spaces, the two spaces, which are shown there in the, sort of the brighter purple, would be um, suspended and unsuspended at at various times, as and when needed, particularly it's really there to allow the maneuvering of large vehicles in the in those streets. I mean, generally speaking, the network management team would put um, on the on the notices on the site on the sorry lamppost and then assigns for those parking zones would indicate that a, a zone or a space was um, suspended and give a period of time for that, so that anyone was aware. Now it may be. It could be for two weeks it would be suspended and then it could be operational again for a couple of weeks and then it could be suspended again and that could go on throughout the whole program but you know uh, the idea certainly would not be to try and catch out residents and make sure that it was clear what spaces were available and weren't thank you chair thank you uh, what is the estimated construction time from beginning to end um, the estimate given by the applicant is a 12-month period for the development. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions for officers? No? Okay, if there are no further questions, then we can move on to voting on whether recommendation one in the report is agreed, that the chief planning officer be authorised to grant planning permission subject to the conditions listed below. Okay. Just... Okay, so uh, we will first vote on um, uh, an amendment to a condition by Councillor Carmel to include bank holidays in the um, management construction plan. Uh, can Could I you, just technically yeah. say that it'll be uh, presumably included in the section 106 because it's not conditioned um, as present, it'll be in the CTMP. Sorry, I missed that. What was the response that you got? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, was, that was my understanding as well. My whole point was that it's not a condition um, because it's included in the CTMP and I just requested that they change the CTMP to include bank holidays. It's not something I don't think that the committee needs to, uh, to vote on. Okay, I think we're, we're happy to move on without a vote. Um, so we will move on to voting on whether recommendation one in the report is agreed. That's on agenda page 15. Uh, Councillor Chabot Verdier, will you be voting for, against, or not voting? For. Uh, Councillor Harcourt? For. Councillor Susflus? For. Councillor Walsh? For. Councillor Carmel? For. Councillor Pascu Dubore? I'll also be voting for. Uh, so that's been approved. Now we move on to whether recommendation two in the report is agreed. That's on agenda page 15. Uh, Councillor Chabot Verdier, will you be voting for, against, or not voting? For. Uh, Councillor Harcourt? Four. Councillor Suslis. Four. Councillor Walsh. Four. Councillor Carmel. Four. Councillor Pascu Tibure. Four. I'll also be voting four. So that application has been approved. Thank you very much.
We can now move on to item five, which is six Barton Road. And can I please ask the presenting officer, Roy Asakba Power, to introduce the report? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So I'd first like to draw the committee's attention to the addendum, uh, some changes to the report. Um, on page 36, condition 10 has been deleted and replaced. Just for clarity, that's just about um, ensuring that a 1.8 metre high screens are provided. Uh, condition 13 on page 37 is also deleted and replaced. Uh, that's to ensure that the air quality requirements set out in condition 12 are provided. And, on page 38, condition 14 should be deleted, that's a duplication. Uh, on page 41, condition uh, 24 is there to secure the obscure glazing uh, on some of the first floor uh, and second floor elevations. Uh, and then again on page 42, there's a new condition referring to the hard landscaped forecourt, that there be no parking on that forecourt. Uh, and there are some other minor changes as well. Thank you. So uh, this application relates to the demolition of the existing two-storey house uh, on uh, Six Barton Road and its replacement with a three-storey plus basement detached house. On the screen, you can see two images. On the left-hand side, you've got the image of the location of the site highlighted in yellow on Barton Road. On the north side, it forms part of, uh, it's adjacent to a terrace of properties which are three-storey to the left. Uh, and to the north, you've got Barton Court Road, and then immediately to the north, you've got Barton Court, which is a seven story block of flats. The site itself is in a conservation area. There are no surrounding listed buildings adjacent to the site. Uh, and then the right hand corner, you can see there's the site highlighted um, in purple. This is an aerial shot uh, at the top, uh, which shows the two story building highlighted with the arrow. Uh, and to the rear is Barton Court, the seven storey block. And then to the left, you've got the three storey building number eight at Barton uh, Road. Uh, the image on the bottom of the screen to the left is showing an image at Street View, which you can see the two storey structure in its context in relation to the seven storey building behind and the three storey building to the left. And then the right hand at the bottom, you've got the parking on the frontage, which uh, is historic, um, has been there for a long time, but um, it's actually been, it's been established by default. But the key thing is that what's being proposed is a new development. Uh, so we start from afresh. This is an uh, image is basically showing the rear of the site. So the top left is the roof of the um, application sites uh, and then uh, the area that's sort of in beige, I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, is a um, covered decking area uh, and then that first floor is set back. Uh, in that image you can also see in the right hand side number eight uh, Barton Road where there's a window in that uh, second floor. That window having been on site a number of offices it's obscure glaze and has a fan light and appears to be in use as a bathroom. Um, then from the rear, you can see on the right hand side, two storey um, with the decking and the covering and you can see the first floor is set back and number eight is to the right of that. This is an image showing what you can see from the rear of number six Barton Courts and those are the windows which are in uh, Barton Courts and unusually the garden of the property goes right up to the rear elevation of the um, Barton Court development. I think that's partly because the site itself was at one time some garages uh, and then during the 80s was converted to a dwelling. And the reason for showing the image is on the right. You can see the sort of delineation of this line, which is indication of the um, windows. So in the top corner, the apex, if you like, there's a bedroom, uh, which is this one here. And that's the same on each floor, each of those floors. You've got the living room here and you've got some more bedrooms, uh, you've got kitchen, you've got a communal stairs, and then just to the left of that, you've got kitchens. So most of those rooms are non-habitable, 
but um, they are within uh, 20 meters. So um, come back to that later. So this is the proposed development, uh, the three images. The one to the left to, is the front elevation. So it's uh, mainly brick, uh, contemporary style, uh, but it's three stories to try and match the scale and massing of the um, properties to the left on Barton Road. The top floor has been mansarded and also set off the boundary. Uh, and then the rear elevation is the image in the middle, and you can see that the land rises, oh sorry, slopes from the front to the rear, so you've got some steps uh, which are from this image appear at the upper ground floor, but there would also be a basement, uh, so that you can see the top of that in that image. Uh, notably, the windows at first floor, these would be obscure glazed or have screening to the terraces. And then similarly at second floor, obscure grey screening to prevent any overlooking to the neighbouring properties. Uh, the image on the right is the flank elevation uh, facing east towards um, Barn Court. Uh, again, the top floor here, you can see it's got open windows. Those would be obscure glazed up to 1.7 metres high. Similarly, there's some screening here to prevent any overlookings and the rest of the elevation is all brick. This shows a cross section. So from the left, you've got Barton Court, Barton Road, uh, and then to the rear are the properties in Barton Court. And you can see the street level uh, and how the property drops down a little towards the rear. And there's accommodation at basement, ground, at first and second floor. There's just some floor plans. You've got basement area, you've got some bedrooms, three bedrooms at uh, basement level. We've got light wells at the front to the bedrooms at the front and uh, a light well at the rear to the bedroom at the rear. Uh, the image on the right shows a footprint in red of the existing building. So uh, for the most part, it's pretty much the same. Uh, the main difference is that uh, where the area extends beyond the red line to the north, that area was the uh, raised decking uh, that's now been sort of if or would be infilled uh, to provide additional accommodation and there's a light well beyond that. Uh, this is the first and second floor so again additional accommodation you've got a home office, a bedroom and TV room but basically habitable rooms uh, and then a balcony uh, also at um, first floor which is screened and then on the top floor which is mansard and set back another balcony which is about 12.4 square meters. This is showing the context. So having shown you all of that, this is the context. Uh, so on the bottom, you've got what's there at the moment. So you can see in the context against the backdrop of the Barton Court, it's a relatively small scale site and scale of development. Uh, and then when you see it against the three story uh, properties to the left, again, it's fairly subservient. Uh, and then what's really happened is that they've added an extra floor, which again is mansarded set back and below the height of the ridge of the uh, existing property. And in fact, as part of the um, discussions and negotiations, they've reduced the height by about 300 millimetres. Uh, so the main concerns that came out through the consultation uh, was residents raised concerns about the lack of affordable housing. There's no requirement to have uh, affordable housing for this site as it falls below the threshold for affordable housing, which is um, 10. So that's the trigger It's well below that. Uh, the loss of the existing uh, building is of no architectural merit uh, and is considered in the report. Um, from our perspective, the design, height, scale, appearance, depth, materials were considered to be, or rather from the neighbour's perspective, were considered to be unacceptable and out of keeping. Uh, officers took a contrary view, having looked at the scale and mass, we think it's appropriate. Uh, the policies in the local plan and indeed the London plan uh, suggest that um, the development should be sympathetic to uh, and although it's not a replica of the surrounding development we consider it to be sympathetic uh, and in that same sort of context we don't think it would have any harm on the impact of the conservation area similarly uh, in terms of neighbors uh, some of the neighbors have said that daylight and sunlight privacy and outlook have been concerns in terms of daylight we had a um, bre report submitted to us with daylight which assesses the daylight impact of the proposals uh, and based on that and an addendum uh, addendum to that report uh, we concluded uh, the report concludes that there's no harm in terms of daylight uh, in terms of privacy the screens that are provided there's no harm in terms of outlook the sighting of the building is pretty much the same as where it is at the moment and it's set back satisfactory away from the neighboring buildings uh, the basements, uh, be, there were concerns about uh, the works destabilizing the surrounding ground, uh, 
policy DC 11 requires that um, applicants submit what's called a construction method statement, uh, which is prepared by a um, qualified structural engineer. Uh, and in this case, that has been provided. Uh, and um, we have no reason to dispute the conclusions of the report, which basically say that there would be no harm. Uh, also, there were concerns raised about construction noise and dust pollution and inconvenience. Obviously, during the works of the site, there will be some nuisance or disturbance, but most of this is covered by other legislation. Um, but from a planning perspective, there would be a construction method statement uh, whilst the works, which are programmed to be 18 months, take place, that would be conditioned. Uh, there's also concerns raised about congestion during construction. Uh, there would be a construction logistics plan provided uh, as part of the um, proposals. Uh, this would be secured by, excuse me, this would be secured by condition. Uh, and there's also a suggestion that the proposals would was, would encourage crime. Again, uh, this was looked at by the application was looked at by the crime prevention officer for the Met Police. They raised no objections to the proposals. So from a planning perspective, our main concerns were that in principle, the proposed use is acceptable because it replaces an existing dwelling. The design we think is sympathetic uh, in terms of residential amenity, daylight, outlook, privacy, noise, traffic, the basement, we think all of those are acceptable uh, and transport colleagues have no objections to the proposal which would exclude parking on the forecourt and would be car free development which would be secured by a unilateral undertaking rather than by conditions so officers therefore recommend that the application be approved thank you very much chair thank you very much roy now uh, we move to questions for officers do we have any questions for officers uh, i'll start with councillor shabot Thank you, Chair. Um, just two general questions is just to check that in the proposal tonight, the privacy hedges that we saw on one of the maps were being retained. Is that the image you're talking about or the photograph? Yeah. OK. Yeah. I mean, these would be retained by uh, condition. Uh, Essentially, there exists it's an existing arrangement which remain unchanged, so it's no worse than existing. So, yeah, that's that ground floor. Obviously, at first floor, there are some additional windows, but they will be obscure glaze to prevent any sort of overlooking. Yeah. Thank you. And this is a second general question was um, just a clarification, really, because of the addenda that removes condition um, number. Uh, is it 10 or no 24 about the um the glaze the glazing oh sorry yeah. so I'm, I'm basically just a bit confused as to whether any changes in the then that was would remove um glazing or privacy shields from balconies or windows no so this was basically just to clarify uh, the first one condition 10 really relates to screens privacy screens uh, which are being provided at uh, first floor and second floor uh, and those are for the terraces and then the condition 24 is for the windows which is basically trying to secure obscure glaze screening up to 1.7 meters high to prevent any overlooking so that safeguards the amenity of the neighboring properties that's the distinction Okay, we'll move to Councillor Harcourt. Thank, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Just a, a few quick points. A few quick points. Um, firstly, um, th there's a skylight or equivalent in the mansard roof and number eight. Um, I just want to see the effect of the new property is going to have on that, whether that does impact. Do you know the bit I'm talking about? I think you said it's obscured and it's a... Are you talking about this one? Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, so it's that one. So if from the front elevation, it's it's in the side looking east. Oh dear, my battery's about to go. Oops. Uh, it said an hour, that didn't last. So just bear with me a second. It's not charging.
I think it's just uh, had a slight explosion. So just bear with me a second. Five minutes, just just five minutes. Yeah, sure. Just, just um, I'm going to propose a five minute break because we're having some technical difficulties. So we'll we'll return to the meeting in five minutes. Just burnt out. This is Neil's.
Can I ask uh, members to return to their to their seats so we can uh, start again, please? Thanks. Okay, thank you for your patience. Uh, we'll continue the, the report now. So we're taking some questions. I do apologize. Um, uh, the power pack, um, I see, broke, that was it. Uh, so I think um, Sir Harcourt was asking some questions. That's right, thank you. Um, yeah, don't worry about the, we seem to have IT problems every time. Um, what was I saying? I was about that skylight in the, which is up yeah. there, the impact of, of the new development on it. So, uh, just on that slide. So you can see the front elevation on the top image and the skylight is just in the mansard roof of that. And on the next slide, you can see the um, dormer in the flank elevation. Uh, that window is shown in the image at the bottom left uh, and it's obscure glazed uh, and it's got a fan light uh, and it's a bathroom window, we believe, from being on site. So in terms of harm, we don't believe that would be harmful because it's non, not a habitable room. Um, so it's a, any uh, development, uh, additional floor at that level would be considered acceptable. Okay, thank you. A couple of points um the second one is really about de uh, design um i uh, you know you can see that the rest of that terrace it's a quite a distinctive uh, terrace and the design of all the buildings along there uh i'm just interested in how this new building fits in and you said it was contemporary design it hasn't followed the or tried to replicate the design of the others so i'm just be interested in officers views on how it it's in, is, is it discordant? Is it complementary or whatever? I can start off and then Alan, my colleague, will take over. But uh, in short, when you're looking at this, obviously you can see that the building is two story. It's quite clearly two story from that image. And you can see uh, its scale. When you look from the rear, it's subservient to the building to the right, it's, which is three story and, and, a, and the above ground floor is, is, is much deeper. Uh, and when you look at it from street level, which is where it's most visible, you would get a view from the looking west along Barton Road, along the flank elevation. Uh, but when you, if you think of it in terms of scale, uh, there's a cross section here, and you can see the mansard roof is set back from the rear, set back from the front, it's also set back from the edge. Uh, so that's on this left hand image, sort of set back from the edge. So it's, it's, subservient. So in terms of scale, when you look at it in that respect, we think that that fits in with the scale of the surroundings, particularly when you view it in the context of the mansion block, which is beyond, which is seven stories, it's much more subservient. So it not considered to be out of scale with um, the adjacent buildings. In terms of materials, I think uh, it goes without saying that um, 
when you look at the existing building, which is here, it's, it's because it was think, built around a similar time, they tried to match the materials in the block because this was one point, the part of the mansion block site, but this site was occupied by some garages previously and uh, subsequently there was accommodation provided at first floor, but they sort of tried to retain sort of the connection by using similar materials. Uh, at this point uh, in the proceedings, as it were, with the applicants, uh, most of the materials are brick and it's only the top floor which looks slightly different, but the materials haven't yet um, been confirmed as these will be secured by uh, condition The only point that I'd add on this is obviously this is quite a unique site in terms of setting. Um, so obviously you've got the, we're looking back to just the aerial, just an image that shows why the context, I think. So obviously you've got the, the kind of triangular arrangement of properties, which all are situated in kind of pairs, as you can see on, can we just go back to, yeah, that'll be, so we, we've got the, the triangular arrangement. They're all paired in terms of the kind of slightly Dutch barn-esque kind of um, appearance of the, the projecting features of the street. Um, I think this would be really hard for any property that comes forward on this site, obviously because of its scale, to replicate that for you. But I think what we've got here is something that's kind of a, a mid-range of kind of trying to impart, kind of um, complement the character of this, the scale, as, as Roy's mentioned, but also trying to kind of bring forward a newer form in terms of the, the mansard appearance. So I think on, it is a very balanced decision that we've taken in terms of the, the, the overall quality of what's coming forward. I think... What we also need to recognise is from the original scheme that came in, we have secured substantial amendments to reduce the scale of that upper floor and the, the kind of contrast in materials, but particularly from the aspects that face onto the, the flatted development and to the east. Okay, thanks. I think sometimes we get spoilt because so many um, applications here, we get CGIs and here we've got a line drawing, which uh, makes it a bit harder to be visualize perhaps, but thanks for that. My final question is about balconies and um, the um, the um, privacy screens and such like, are they acoustic? Because, you know, um, there's always a problem up there and I appreciate, you know, given changes in weather and such like, we were get, getting in, you know, much warmer summers and so on, everybody wants to be outside. And the, obviously any noise and people can, aren't being antisocial, they're actually being social. And they're not uh, doing anything that is out of order, but noise nonetheless carries. So a little bit concerned about those. Otherwise, I, I must admit, I'm happy enough with this development. So on the screen, you can see, if I start from the beginning, actually. So the property itself at ground floor has a, has a garden. Often uh, in these sort of scenarios, if it's flats, you know, the the flats on the upper floors wouldn't have access to any amenity space and in this particular situation they could as you can see from the images that um it, for the existing arrangement they could go right up to the boundary and you know you know use a garden in in a leisurely way in which you know you would expect for a, for a residential rear garden uh, but they provide a screen which separates uh, from those properties to the rear and that will be retained so in addition to that, uh, they provided some uh, terraces at um, upper floors, but these are quite modest in size. So RSBD talks about allowing uh, terraces up to 15 square meters. Uh, and that way uh, in limiting the size, it limits the number of people that can actually use it. Uh, the terrace at uh, first floor, you can see, oops, sorry, next one, terrace at, at first floor is only 4.3 meters and uh, it's ancillary to a study uh, and you know and there's an access to to that area uh, from the staircase but it's fairly modest uh, and it's screened so you couldn't actually get that many people on there anyway uh, and it's set away from the boundary to the left which is uh, number eight and it's also set away from the boundary uh, for um, uh, Barton Court uh, and then at second floor, you've got on the right hand side, a, a terrace area, which is 12.4 square meters. And again, that's below the 15, which is set out in our own sort of um, SBD. So it's considered to be modest, obviously it's screened. Um, but, you know, there are other amenity areas which could be used, but essentially it's, um, it's something that we would deem acceptable in terms of its scale. 
Thanks. Okay, uh, Councillor Suslis. Yeah, I had a quick question um, related to condition eight about cycle surge. Um, if you could uh, indicate um, what form, if there's been any indication what form the uh, cycle storage may take or where exactly it may be um, uh, placed. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll just um, make this image larger, that might help. Uh, on this image on the right hand side, which has got the footprint in red of the existing building, uh, at the front, this is the main sort of entrance. You've got three little, you probably can't see them if I'm sorry. Oops, that might help. Uh, this is a bin store, this is a bin store, uh, and this is a cycle storage area, it's been highlighted as, but we don't have any details of those yet, so we've asked for details of our condition. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I'll go to Councillor Walsh and then I'll go to Councillor Pascoe Tuberi. Councillor Walsh. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a question on the parking provision. Um, obviously, this is going to be a car-free uh, development, but looking at the pictures there of the neighbouring properties, many of them either enjoy what would seem to be on-street parking privileges or parking off-street. Um, my question simply is, does this hold up to the test of reasonableness to uh, exclude this development from having access to parking either on street or off street uh, where its neighbours do enjoy that privilege. Through the chair, thank you. Um, so the first, well, I'll deal with the second part of the question first. When you uh, have a new development, uh, there's a requirement under the London plan and our own local plan for it to be uh, car free developments, i.e. permit free if it's within a good PTEL accessibility area, public transport accessibility levels are good. Uh, this particular location is in PTEL 5, uh, and uh, the London plan normally says that if something's above PTEL 4, it should be car-free development, it should be encouraged. Uh, and um, on that basis, uh, we normally would attach conditions uh, to prevent car-free. We found that that's not the best mechanism. So we're actually using a uh, well, we were recommending using a unilateral undertaking to secure uh, a car free development so they can't apply for um, permits. Uh, and that's the first part. Uh, the second part is that uh, this historically was a garage uh, and um, over a period of time, uh, they have used the forecourt for parking. Uh, and you can see in this image on the screen, in the right hand corner, there are two vehicles parked on the frontage. Uh, normally our standards in our SPD require a, a provision of 4.8 uh, deep, sorry, 4.8, yeah, deep, and then 2.4 meters wide uh, for a parking space. Uh, and those dimensions are, um, you know, a requirement as it were. And the submissions made to us didn't include any sort of provision for a parking space, rather just a general forecourt. So we've attached a condition uh, which um, prevents parking on the forecourt, but should they be minded to come back with uh, a revision to that condition, they could apply to potentially get parking on that forecourt if the layout was deemed satisfactory. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll go to Councillor Pascoe to worry. Yeah, sure, Councillor Carmel. Just that we're, we're on this point, and um, I, I completely agree with the, the reasonableness test. Um, um, London plan says it should be encouraged, but this is a replacement single family dwelling for a single family dwelling. It currently has off street parking that's uh, probably permitted under the Prescription Act for uh, at least two vehicles. It'd probably get three smart cars on there. And normally we say that uh, a single uh, family, we, we refuse the right to. Uh, car parking permits if for instance a building goes from one flat to two flats that only one flat uh, can uh, can can have a parking permit and it does seem to me um given that i believe that they've got um by by, by prescription uh, a right to off-street parking they currently have a right to an off-street permit uh, and they're not increasing the number of residential units it does seem perverse um, uh, to, to make it a, a car-free car development. So in theory, they could have two off-street 
and one and one uh, and one on street parking. So they're going from a an allowance of three down to zero, and that does seem uh, a little what's the word harsh. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I mean the reality is uh, the parking that's there overhangs the pavement. So because it overhangs the pavements, um, you can see that. I can show you uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, 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 if you just bear with Councilor me. Councillor Carmel, if you could allow officers uh, to, to answer the question, please. Thank you. Show you from this image. So you can see that the white car is, well, the, the, the pavement basically is where this um, pillar is. If you like this pillar on the left hand side with the green vegetation, that's the line. So uh, the black car is marginally within, just about, I suspect, uh, but the white car is overhanging the pavements, the footpath, and that's not lawful. So what we were suggesting was that we, you know, as I said before, they could come back and change that, but at this point, we didn't want to um, discuss uh, because it has taken some time to get to where we are. So the conditions there, but it can be varied have you got a photograph of the where the rear of the white car they're just not reversed far enough um so there may be space that they can go back because it looks about um what two or three inches over the black car is wholly in and if you have a look at the property line here the uh the center of the pavement of the next door property is far further out than that uh so if you're looking at down barton road um and i've gone down that road a, a many, many times that the, the property levels uh, change uh, down there. I still think that you can certainly get at least one. I suspect the white car could reverse a little bit more and have come in at a tighter angle and uh, uh, get in, get in thing. The, 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 point, the point is that they have acquired, whether they should have or not, the right to off-street parking there. There's a drop curb, so the council has acknowledged acknowledge that they have a currently have they have a right for uh, at least two on street uh, two off street uh, parking parking spaces and they have a right to uh, an on street permit as well and you the initial my initial point is you're going from three down to zero and that seems perverse and just just one point uh, i can see that you're talking about the, the the white car you know perhaps being set back further on the top image on the oops oh dear, sorry uh, there we go. Top image that footpath actually provides access to the rear of the site and to the um, mansion block at the back. So it's slightly different. Yeah, was well, it, it's uh, access to the mansion block. Yeah, because it's a very unusual relationship along here. Um, the access is down the side of this um, where my cursor is. So that's. That's why it's unsuitable in the way that it's been presented. That's not to say that it wouldn't be if an application was submitted in the future. Sorry, Matt, you may want to come in there. Yes, Matt, go ahead. I oh, was sorry, just to the chair, I would clarify. I mean, this is this is a new bill because they've demolished this. So we're under statutory obligation to apply the policies that are relevant. And we do have a policy that's quite clearly uh, seeking car free. Obviously, in London, it's an acute problem with air pollution and congestion and so forth. So that will be the default position as we seek it to be car free. Now, if, there's, if we consider this exceptional circumstances, for example, it's in a poor area of public transport accessibility, then we may exercise flexibility. We didn't feel there was any justification to do that in, in this instance. I would also point out it is a unilateral undertaking. So it's something the applicant has actually submitted to us as part of the application, it's not a 106, which we sought to agree with them. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Shabot Verdier, would you like to come in on that? With apologies to Councillor, it's on the point um, um, to ask whether you're, if the front of the house is no longer needed, whether you're going to be creating two parking spaces in front of it, or um, if the front of the house is no longer needed for parking and therefore they don't need to yeah, I mean, as it stands, uh, it would just be a full court with hard, hard landscaping, uh, and there's no proposal to um, change that under this political application. But they could, in the future, come forward if they wanted to, and they could explore that. But certainly, as Matt has already said, I said in the presentation, the other policy is for it to be car-free development. So, 
Okay, Councillor Pascu Tiburi. Thank you very much. Um, my question is about design. Um, I feel that the existing building has been slightly maligned. Um, looking at it, there's quite a number of things it does which are pretty clever, um, not least in replicating um, both a lot of the lines of the 1920s Voisey houses on one side, uh, while well, at the same time um, a, a, lot, a lot of the uh, visual ticks which are found in the 1930s Barton Court on the other side. Um, looking at uh, slide 10, um, there, there's a number of things which sort of strike me. The first is that um, the whole of the front elevation, as it stands, is uh, developed along horizontal lines. To put it in layman's terms, it means that you know the windows are largely landscape rather than portrait. You have loads of horizontal lines. That's something that uh, Voices Architecture is pretty well known for. It's also a big feature of Art Deco, as uh, Barton Court is. Um, if you look at the current house, again, that mirrors those things. It's quite clever, even the glazing bars mirror both what's in the 1920s housing and what's in the 1930s flats. Um, the proposed new house, it's all, it's all done on verticals. So I can see how it can conform to the massing and I can see how it can um, conform to the scale. But in terms of design, um, I'm quite curious as to how, um, how it seems to have links to either the 1920s and 1930s properties on site. You can, so, so as discussed, I think the, the importance here is just to recognise that this isn't a modification of the existing building. Mm -hmm. the, the original building that occupies the site has been um, modified substantively over time. So as you can see in the images that were presented, you know, this isn't an original feature where we would give it group value to the existing kind of 1930s flatted block. I think you're quite right in terms of the description of the existing properties that sit to the, the west, they, they do have a distinctive character and a distinctive pattern of development. But I think what we've got to recognize here is what's coming forward, you know, isn't necessarily intended to be kind of a replication of the format of those buildings. I think it will be very difficult to achieve that for a new build of this example. So what, what we've got here, particularly in terms of the front elevation is obviously a proposal where it's trying to in part complement the character of what's there, but not trying to completely replicate mm -hmm. it. Um, and I think as officers, obviously the, the, the actual detail of the elevation is considered to be acceptable, recognizing it does have a different proportionality. It does so to activate the elevation slightly more than the existing building that occupies the site as well. So it does have its own character, but then kind of complements in part what is in, in the surrounding townscape without fully kind of serving to completely replicate that form. And I, and I fully appreciate that, you know, you don't want to do a pastiche of what's come before, but we're, we're looking at sort of knocking down a building, which for better, for worse over the years has grown into the landscape and sort of fits in pretty harmoniously with the, the grain of what's um, existing there. And at the same time, you're replacing it with something which, um, forgive me, but apart from um, a slightly similar mansard, and even then that doesn't replicate the uh, sort of curve that you see in the 1920s Mansard roofs, um, it, it seems to have very, very little visual relevance really with anything that is what is in a conservation area. Yeah, but I mean, again, to, to reiterate, I mean, th this building that occupies the site now is quite an anomaly within its set in the, the conservation area itself. There isn't a regular format of, you know, of, of buildings within this area. They do show different parts of the evolution of the conservation area, particularly if you look to, you know, the, the buildings that form part of the triangle, the properties, you've got the flatted block and then to the north, you've got a different typology. So there isn't, a, you know, a kind of a strong principle of one form of development that would kind of give us, a, you know, a cue to say, actually, that would be harmful to the conservation area. This is quite a unique site in terms of its situation. The existing building, as I say, has been modified over time. Um, and although it may have some insignificant group value, th that group value isn't considered to be enough in terms of its current architectural appearance that it would kind of give rise to harm within the conservation area. The design of the new build, again, is, you know, is seeking to have something that complements, but also creates its own identity overall. And I think that's where the balance view comes from in terms of the fact that this is considered to be a high quality infill development overall. 
but I, I'm just sorry, I'm, I'm just struggling to sort of work out on what basis is considered to be a high quality infill, bearing in mind the differences in uh, the, the, the sort of visuals uh, between what was there and what is being proposed. Okay, I mean, Alan, yeah, if you'd like to, yeah. I can come back in on that. I mean, again, these issues are very subjective in terms of how people can appreciate. I, I completely understand the perspective that you take. I think as officers, we've got to take a degree of pragmatism, particularly in terms of how the MPPF policy leads us in terms of the quality of new build design and the fact that it shouldn't necessarily just replicate the form of an existing development. Now, as I say, the, the heritage test as part of that have, have been completely factored into our assessment and I think the the key part here is the fact that the existing building has limited group value with the adjacent um, flatted block has limited group value with the the adjacent properties and also has been heavily modified over time so it's got very limited contribution towards the significance of the conservation area and to its evolution and, uh, and beside that also the fact that the quality of the new build is considered to meet that policy test from the MPPF and our own local plan policies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Chavot Verdier. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I want to talk about the determination of, of the fact that this fits in with the areas. It's not the first time that I expressed in this committee that I have a disagreement with what's proposed for West Kensington uh, in terms of um, going with eight adjacent buildings now you'll have to forgive me if i mispronounce this but next door are voisey houses and then overlooking is a 1930s beautiful barton court at the end of that road on the eastern part are mews and across the road are beautiful victorian houses um with thanks to the person who's taken us back to 1975 in the report to tell us about the history of this building could you go even further and tell us whether that was built with barton court after barton court I mean, our records show that um, there was a garage there. I couldn't tell you when that garage was 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 on site, but it looks, looking at the appearance of it, it was ancillary, particularly when you take into account that a boundary goes right up to the rear elevation of uh, Barton Court, because that's a very unusual relationship, which is kind of what Alan is alluding to. It's a unique sort of uh, sighting, if you like. Uh, normally, you'd have um, you know back-to-back -back properties or property that's... Um, has uh, some sort of separation from the properties to the rear, and this this doesn't have that. So, in that sense, uh, it may well have you know it seemed from our from our understanding that uh, had a relationship with the Barton Court. But having said that, when you look at the images from the photographs, the elevation would have changed because um, the first floor, so well, the, the property was in use as garages, uh, and then some uh, accommodation was added up to first floor in the eighties. Uh, but what's notable when you look at this is that the materials uh, seem to be similar to those on Barn Court, and they wouldn't necessarily have been the same because they would have had garage doors, etc. So they've tried to match the materials to make it sympathetic, and I think by having similar materials that helps it to sort of sit in that transition. So I think because we have a condition, uh, we can try and do the same with this development to try and make sure the materials match that setting. Uh, obviously, we're not trying to replicate and do light for light, but it's trying to match the setting. So the building would be predominantly brick, and therefore the kind of overall appearance of it might would would was fitting more comfortably. As far as the Voisey design is concerned, I mean, you can see from the image there that you know it's typically that they are steep um, mansard roofs, uh, and that's a particular architect at that time, uh, but those buildings are not any buildings of merit, are not uh, listed buildings. They're a particular style, which is acknowledged. Uh, and I think as a sort of a notion and a tip of the hat to that, that's what this uh, development is trying to do by having the mansard design at the top. And I think initially when the applicants came in, I'll just show you this uh, image here. So on the right hand side, you can see uh, this flank elevation. And at one point they had the top floor, which is was proposed to be zinc coming all the way down to the ground floor uh, to try and sort of highlight that Boise um, style, but it was quite overwhelming, we thought. So we sort of you know, moved away from that and encouraged them to move away from that. So this is a much more sympathetic, we feel, uh, response to this particular environment, which is, which is very much a transition between the flats and then the Boise properties. So as Alan said, it's, it's kind of like standalone, unique, um, so yeah. 
so to clarify, up until 1975, which is maybe what I misunderstood, up until 1975, there's no dwelling, there's no accommodation, it's just a parking space. But that's still built in the style of Barton Court. That's correct, yeah. Okay, thank you. I wanted to talk about what some of the residents have raised with regards to loss of light and privacy. So um, on some of the slides you've shown, actually, uh, we can see that the back of the property, and um, there's quite some space, in fact, number five, perhaps, um, there's space between the property and the um, people at Barton Court, but um, we now know that the application is to increase the length of the house up until, um, well, the length of the house of the neighbours currently. How close does that put the house to the people at Barton Court? And is there any resulting loss of sunlight for the residents at Barton Court? Okay, so... Um... This image on the screen at the moment, so if I just started from that slide, uh, you can see this is the view from the rear of Six Barn Court, the image at the top, and you've got uh, the vegetation which would be retained. So at ground floor, those windows behind, some of those are habitable, some of them are non-habitable. Those would be screened by the vegetation and that would be continue to be the case, so there's no change there. So the windows at first floor and above, um, as it stands, uh, you can see uh, the sort of uh, architect's drawing on the right hand side. I, can, I don't know if you can see my cursor in the sort of bot left, bottom left corner, this um, rear elevation, which is the building line of the proposed development, uh, matches the building at number eight. So if I go back a stage, so you can see here that first floor is set back. Uh, and then it would be brought forward to match the white building at the rear. Uh, and overall, that would be um, a projection towards the rear by about uh, four metres um, at first floor, but two metres at uh, ground floor. Uh, so when you go back to this image here, uh, that relationship, if you like, it's 12.5 12, 12 metres, I think, to that, the nearest habitable, the furthest habitable window, which is a bedroom. And the nearest one, it would be about 7.5 meters, uh, but the windows that are proposed would be obscure glazed and that would mitigate any overlooking. Uh, and then when you think in terms of uh, outlook, uh, which is one of your questions, the setting is such that you've got sufficient space. If you drew a 45 degree line from the window at ground floor, uh, if that line was breached, which is our standard, then you'd have an issue with outlook but that line wouldn't be breached uh, from the rear. Uh, and even if it was breached, uh, and it's not, it wouldn't be in this case uh, at the side potentially, then you've still got an on-site judgment. And our view is that no, um, this doesn't warrant the withholding of any permission because it complies. Could I ask you if you could go to slide number six and on the proposed rear northwest elevation section, which is the middle section, um, could you show me which windows are obscure glazed? Yeah. So there are three windows at that first floor level. The one on the right would be obscured uh, to 1.7 metres high. The one in the middle would have a screen because that's the one to the terrace. And the one on the left would also be obscure glazed to 1.7 metres high. And then at top floor, there's a terrace, uh, which would be screened by a privacy screen at um, 1.8 metres high. Thank you. I had another one about what's raised about the works on going at Palliser Road, uh, number one, which is at the Lewis House. Um, residents have requested that part of the um, construction plan be sort of organised to match the works that are already going on there. I don't know if you've given that. Yeah, I mean, our colleagues in highways, uh, they have some power to sort of coordinate construction uh, management plans. So there's a construction management plan proposed for this development and is secured by condition and it's a construction management plan and construction uh, demolition management plan uh, and those that document would um, be considered by our transport colleagues and they would seek to coordinate with adjacent development to try and make sure that um, through uh, the logistics plan which is a movement of vehicles to and from the site that there's a bit of coordination Thank you. And final question was the follow up on the councillor's question is that if the cars the residents currently are using can't be parked on their on the front of their house anymore, um, does that mean that they are able to park them somewhere on Barton or Palliser or Barons Court? Um, would that increase pressure on parking in the area? 
Uh, I mean, uh, it's a it's CPZ, so you know there's charge for parking. But uh, as you know, pointed out earlier, this you know is a policy of the London plan and of our own local plan to have car-free development for new development. So that is the expectation. If if this was a PTAL less than four, we wouldn't be seeking to try and obtain car-free development. So. The alternative is, you know, to try and encourage, you know, more sustainable means of transport, which is public transport. Uh, and again, there's an opportunity if that's not satisfactory or you know, that needs to be challenged that they could uh, challenge out uh, through varying the condition or seeking to have it removed. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Councillor Carmel? Yes, sir. Well, I have my questions. I just did one on the parking to begin with. Uh, firstly, this, this one is a condition. Condition four doesn't mention no working on bank holidays. I do know, and I have mentioned this on a number of occasions, and we have amended it on a number of occasions. It would be nice if the standard conditions could be amended to include no working on bank holidays. But I'm going to propose I, that... Uh, I can say that I, during the presentation of the first item, I noted that, and um, yes. And the recommendation actually allows officers to make minor changes to conditions, and that would be one of the minor changes that we would make. Lovely. So we don't need to vote on it then. Um, the, the next question I have um, is with regard to the principle of overdevelopment. Could you tell me what the current size uh, of the footprint of the building is and what the proposed size of the proposed building is? Uh, the existing building is about 10 metres wide by 10 metres deep. Uh, in terms of floor area, the uh, existing building is about 100 square metres in total. Uh, and the proposed building was just over or just under 200 square metres, it's doubling. But that you know, takes into account that you've got a basement as well as an additional floor at uh, second floor, effectively. But that wouldn't include the, the balconies in that... Uh... Not as a floor area, no. But, uh, and I, I, I note that uh, uh, Councillor Harcourt mentioned about uh, acoustic screens. I mean, one metre 70, uh, I'm basically one metre 90, I stand there. Um, what is going to be the distance from the edge of uh, the balcony to the nearest uh, uh, habitable window in, say, Barton Court? Uh, this is what I mentioned earlier. It's, it's um... It varies between 7.5, depending where you are, and 12.5. But um, the applicant actually has, I should have picked this, pointed this out when I mentioned it earlier, has um, agreed to increase the uh, height rather than 1.7 to 1.8 metres high. So the privacy screen, as, show, as highlighted in the condition, is actually higher than what we would normally require, which would be 1.7. They've actually proposed 1.8. So that's condition 10 on page 36. Um, the next question I, I don't actually know the answer to. Uh, you talked about the, uh, the balconies policy being uh, 15 metres. Uh, is, is, is not the balconies policy cumulative as opposed to individual? Because otherwise you could put you know, eight balconies of 14 metres, uh, which were eight times 14, 80, eight fours of 32, 100, 112 metres of balconies and still not exceed the, um, the 15 metre rule. I, I was under the impression that the, the maximum of the balconies was a cumulative um, uh, calculation as opposed to an individual calculation. Or am I wrong on that? Uh, I don't have the policy right in front of me at this moment in time, but it is an SBD uh, in the SBD, which is guidance uh, rather than the policy. So it's something that we would look at uh, and try and apply. Uh, and on that basis, when you look at what's being proposed, I think it's um, 4.2 at first floor and then 12.4 at uh, second floor which puts it around about 16 yeah so it's you know it's marginally over what you know that that amount so it wouldn't be sufficient to us to withhold permission we re or recommend permission uh, thank you for that we do seem to be hearing the word marginal and marginally quite a lot tonight when exceeding uh, our, our, our policy um going back to the skylight that councillor harcourt raised so you put the photograph uh, back up here and uh, um, I presume you've done a site, a site visit, because that doesn't look like obscure glazing. Uh, 
yeah. uh, to me. But if you've done a site visit and you, you tell me that it is obscure blazing, I will, I will take your word for it. Two officers have been on site and they both confirm. In fact, Alan has been on site as well to, to confirm that that is obscure blazing. But mo moving on, but on that subject, I've just been having a look at the, uh, the planning history for 8 Barton Road. Uh, which is the next door property, there doesn't appear to be any planning condition that requires them to have obscure glazing in that window. Would your judgment be, be different uh, as to uh, the effect on the neighbouring property if tomorrow they replace the obscure glazing with uh, clear glazing? Uh, we can only look at the application that's before us and obviously what you're putting forward is not a scenario that's in play at the moment. So uh, in terms of what's there, that's how we have to judge it. Uh, and what's there is, uh, you know, an obscure glazed window. So we judge it on that, uh, yeah. But were they to do it tomorrow and before you put the decision letter out, you'd have to bring it back to committee because there'll be information which uh, we haven't fully been appreciated of, even that, though- That might take some time, I would imagine, to arrange all that, so, yeah. Get a glazier in tomorrow, just change the glass, easy peasy. Um, the, uh, I, ha I do have to say that I find it uh, a little hard to say that this incongruous uh, proposal is going to, can be judged, and I, I know it is a judgment call, but I find it quite hard to believe that it is either preserving or enhancing the conservation area, bringing with it such a jarring and discordant um, new style uh, into the the conservation area. Um, I just wondered if you could f further ex ex explain why, um, especially the points that uh, my colleague raised about uh, verticality as opposed to horizontal um, um, emphasis on on the proposals. And lastly, um, I can't, because it's very difficult to tell on line drawing. What sort of material is the proposed mansard element of the proposal uh, designed to be made from, please? Uh, so I'll start off. Uh, in terms of the design, I think we've already said that um, this is a unique location, a transition between two areas of different styles of properties. I think, um, and as Alan pointed out earlier, um, that um, design is subjective to some extent. So, and I think you said that yourself. So I think from our perspective, we made a judgment that we think in terms of scale, massing, appearance is acceptable. And when it comes to the design in terms of the overall appearance, uh, notwithstanding that, you know, there might be a slightly more vertical emphasis, they've got some more window openings than they have at, mo at the moment in terms of the front elevation, the rear elevation. But that doesn't negate the fact that uh, the policy allows for a bit of latitude to have, you know, designs of differing types which means that you don't have to replicate the buildings next door or copycats. Uh, so that means that we have to judge this particular proposal on its merits. And uh, we consider having looked at it in terms of its modest scale compared to the surrounding buildings and its overall general appearance to be acceptable. Uh, in terms of the materials, uh, what the applicant proposed originally was to have zinc. But as I mentioned earlier, the condition uh, is attached to secure those details at a later date because we're not necessarily convinced at this point so we can still have time to secure those i know that uh, you, you know, it's basically going to be a reserve matter on conditions but it doesn't actually give me a great deal of confidence when there is already uh, not just a marginal change in the transition and i don't think the dif differing architectural styles between the 20s and 30s are, are actually that um that large, but this is, in my opinion, um, going going or highly likely to be a, dis a discordant feature within the conservation area, uh, which will neither preserve or enhance it. And the, the 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 entire shape of the mansard is just alien uh, to the surrounding um, the surrounding the surrounding the surrounding properties. And you know, I I know this, the talk about transition and this and that and the other, and I can still hear the words of Barbara Voda for those of us who've got long enough memories about the difference between homage and pastiche uh, when we're talking about conservation areas. Um, but I am leaning uh, against this application. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you very much, Councillor Carmel. Are there any further questions? Okay, if there are no further questions, then we will move on to voting. So we'll uh, begin by voting on whether recommendation one in the report is agreed, that's on agenda page 33, that the Chief Planning Officer be authorised to grant permission subject to the conditions listed below and a unilateral legal undertaking. Councillor Chavot Berdier. Against. Councillor Harcourt. For. Councillor Suslis. For. Councillor Walsh. For. Councillor Carmel. Against. Councillor Pascu Tilbure. Against. And I'll be voting for. So uh, that recommendation has been approved. And now we move on to uh, recommendation two in the report, which is also on agenda page 33, that the chief planning officer, after consultation with the head of law and the chair of the planning and development control committee, be authorized to make any minor changes to the proposed unilateral legal undertaking or conditions, which may include the variation, addition, or deletion of conditions. Any such changes shall be within their discretion. Councillor Chavot Verdier. Four. Councillor Harcourt. Four. Councillor Suslis. Four. Councillor Walsh. Four. Councillor Carmel. Four. Councillor Pascal Dubare. Four. And I'll also be voting four. So that uh, application has been approved. Thank you very much. So we now move on to item six, which is 227 Wood Lane. Uh, can I ask the presenting officer, John Sanchez, to please introduce the report? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, before I start, I would like to draw uh, the members' attention to the addendum. Um, three further representations have been received since the publication of the report. Um, one is from the St. Quintin and Woodlands Neighbourhood Forum and St. Helens Residents Association in North Kensington. They objected to the application and the objections are summarized in section four of the original report. Um, the latest representation received questions the application's assessment against London plan policy D9B and the Hillingdon judgment. The second representation is from a person writing in support of women's pioneer organization in terms of providing assistance for women in society who are struggling to find affordable housing within a safe and secure environment. And finally, there's a further representation in support of the application. The application was first submitted to the council in January, 2020. The proposals have been developed by a joint venture between the site owner and occupier women's pioneer housing and its preferred developer hub. During the course of the determination of the application, proposals have been significantly revised. The proposed development presented at the last committee on the 11th of October was for the demolition of the existing buildings on the site and for the redevelopment in the form of an 18 storey building plus part lower ground floor with two connected 
seven storey elements providing a mix of residential units, office space and co-living accommodation. At the last meeting on the 11th of October, the committee did not agree with the officer's recommendation and decided to refuse planning permission on four grounds. One relates to the height of the proposed development outside a designated tall buildings area. Two, due to it failing to conform with energy efficient standards and its potential to overheat in the summer months. Three, due to the detrimental impact of the proposed development on the residential amenity of the surrounding properties, including loss of outlook and sunlight, and four, due to the standard of the accommodation. The purpose of this report is to enable officers to clarify and understand the reasons for refusal provided by the committee and the extent to which this harm is contrary to the development plan policies before officers write to the Mayor of London. So if we take um, the four reasons, reason one relating to the proposed development outside a designated tall buildings area. The committee report on the 11th of October, 2022, clarifies the approach taken in the assessment of the development of a tall building. The site is not within the areas identified for the development of a tall building under local plan policy DC3, and the report acknowledges there will be some conflicts with London plan policy D9. Officers wish to confirm that they did have regard to the Hillingdon Judicial Review decision and to the recent Secretary of State calling decision for the Edith Summerskill House application in this borough. Both decisions effectively confirm that policy D9 should not be considered as a gateway policy. Instead, consideration of the impacts assessment framework of the policy should be focused on the harm caused by the development to understand the overall extent of the conflict with policy D9. The fact that the site is not within a, design, a designated area for tall buildings is not in itself sufficient grounds to refuse planning permission. The proposals need to be considered against the impacts assessment framework of the policy, as well in order to establish the extent of any harm that would result as a, uh, from this. In terms of the assessment that was carried out by officers, we can now confirm that the status of the approved gateway east building that formed part of the Stanhope approved gateway redevelopment proposal and which was highlighted in the townscape analysis. In this case, two of the three buildings on the site have been built and the gateway east building permitted up to high to 23 storeys will be the next phase coming forward. Officers have also confirmed that the site has now commenced in terms of initial piling work, and it is now very likely that the Gateway East building will be constructed as summarized in the Townscape View analysis. So, so this is in reference to the building outlined in blue in this particular view. In terms of re reason refusal number two, this related to failing to conform with energy efficient standards and its potential to overheat in the summer months. On this particular point, officers wish to clarify that in terms of meeting energy saving standards, the proposed development exceeds the GLA 35% carbon reduction requirement by 23% giving the scheme an overall reduction of 58% and in compliance with the development plan. Since the last meeting, the applicant has also committed to include PVs on top, on top of the roof area. In total, 61 new PV panels could be incorporated 
which would result in a further improvement on the on site wide energy savings for this development. This uh, particular slide shows um, is a section through that roof area. So this is level 17, which is the amenity space at roof level for the co-living development with the plant area above and the PVs would be incorporated within the overall height of the plant enclosure. A condition is proposed that would require the energy strategy to be updated and resubmitted for approval. The applicants are also committed to targeting further improvements and reduce the carbon offset contribution further once the contractor is on board. In terms of overheating, which was referred uh, within the reason of refusal, officers feel that, that this needs to be considered alongside the energy and quality comfort of, of the living um, provision for the residents. All the private rooms within the scheme are compliant in terms of overheating. Only two areas of the whole development are identified where mitigation will be needed. This relates to the two co-living floors, the level seven, and this is due to the provision of cooking facilities on this level and level 16, where windows can't be open for, fa uh, for passive ventilation. In the case of the proposed Women Pioneer housing office space, um, they've had to introduce additional glazing in order to improve the internal levels of daylight and sunlight and the employer's well-being. And for this reason, again, um, it pushes up the energy requirements for this particular space. Overall, mechanical ventilation will be provided throughout the building to ensure that fresh air is provided throughout the year to maintain internal air quality, with a heat pump system and PVs able to control heating and cooling of the building. In terms of the co-living use, tempered air would be provided to each co-living unit sufficient to prevent summertime overheating. In terms of reason number three, relating to the detrimental impacts of the proposed development on residential amenity or surrounding properties, including loss of outlook and sunlight. The committee report set out that the proposal performs well in terms of daylight, sunlight and overshadowing and is consistent with what would be expected in an urban area. The results of the assessment submitted indicate that the proposal would show a high compliance in terms of BRE guidelines for daylight and in, and in terms of those properties uh, those, sorry, those windows where there's a non-compliance, this is primarily due to the design of the existing buildings and not a direct result of the proposed development. The two images uh, on the screen at the moment highlight the high level compliance with the BRE guidance with regard to daylight. The green indicates compliance of windows. The yellow indicates windows with a deviation from BRE, but importantly, the majority are in respect to dual aspect rooms where the primary window also shows full compliance. In terms of sunlight, 158 out of 159 rooms meet the standard. As highlighted in the previous report, only one window marginally falls fails to meet this guidance, a bedroom in Cavill House that forms part of a dual aspect room. In relation to overshadowing, the report states that all the amenity areas tested for overshadowing comply with the guidance. In relation to outlook, the proposed building would be taller than the neighboring four and two story blocks to the north and west. The changes to the design of development, however, have taken into account this relationship and is laid out with a step arrangement from the tallest element at the southern tip of the application site, stepping down to the two-storey wings to the north and west. 
The 18 storey element of the proposal would be 60 metres from Pankhurst House and over 100 metres from the closest property in Benworth Road. In terms of reason number four, due to the standard of the accommodation, the debate at the last meeting was in relation to the quality of the co-living accommodation and specifically in relation to the appropriateness and standards of shared amenity spaces and the kitchen ar arrangements. The appropriateness of the standard of accommodation for co-living was assessed under policy H16 and the Mayor's published draft London plan guidance. The assessment of the design and standard of accommodation provided in the co-living building is considered to be acceptable when assessed against these, these guidance and policy. And this view was supported by the GLA officers in the Mayor's stage one response. As set out in the last meeting, each typical floor is designed with 15 co-living units, and two of these are designed as wheelchair accessible units. The co-living units are designed for a single occupancy, meaning a maximum of only 15 residents per floor. Similarly, the design and size of each individual room is in excess of the GLA guidance. The applicant has confirmed since the last meeting the inclusion of the provision of a microwave oven in each individual kitchenette area, in addition to the two ring induction hob within the kitchenette. In terms of adequate storage capacity for both individual units and the shared kitchen facilities, these exceed the GLA storage capacity. Each resident will have a lockable personal storage space within a wall or base unit within the communal space, in addition to the storage provision within each individual room. The applicant has also confirmed that they will be providing communal kitchen utensils in the common areas to prevent these having to be carried to and from individual rooms. As, high, high, as highlighted, level seven would be located almost in the center of the building with additional communal facilities provided at level 16 and at ground floor. Two 13 person lifts are proposed within this development uh, in order to gain access to the individual floors and the communal facilities. In the stage one response, GLA officers considered the proposed scheme would provide an acceptable level of convenient access for, the fut for future residents. Notwithstanding this, the applicant has confirmed a commitment to increasing and improving the specification of the lifts in order to in increase the performance and reduce waiting times at peak periods in line with the Chartered Institutes of Building Service Engineers guidance. Officers propose an additional condition be attached requiring a commitment to provide providing these lifts in accordance with the standards. The applicant is also proposing the provision of e-bike and e-scooter charging facilities within the development located at the lower ground floor level. The applicant states the charging and storage facilities would cater up to 50 e-scooters in addition to long-term cycle parking spaces that are being provided. In conclusion, officers consider that on the basis of the clarification and justification provided in the addendum report, together with the amendments the applicant is prepared to make to the scheme in response to the proposed reasons for refusal, there is sufficient justification provided to demonstrate that the application proposals on balance are acceptable in planning policy terms. Accordingly, the officer's recommendation as set out in the committee report on the 11th of October and as set out in paragraph 4.2 of the addendum report stand for further consideration. Thank you.
Thank you very much, John. Um, I'd now like to invite uh, two speakers to speak in support, Tracy Downey from Women's Pioneer Housing and Damien Sharkey from HIN, and you have five minutes between you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we are grateful to be heard in front of this committee again, um, especially given the multiple letters of support and interest we've received from the public and press following the decision a couple of weeks ago. Um, so you've heard last time about Women's Pioneer's 100 year history and how we continue to offer much needed affordable housing for single women. I'd like to emphasize that both our office and Browning House are poor quality and not an efficient use of the land. The 36 small studios at Browning House all lack sufficient modern day amenities as well as level access. And it's not about a lack of maintenance or improvement. These homes are simply no longer suitable as a lifetime home for single women to have a good quality of life. This application seeks to provide 60 dual aspect, high quality homes, which will be almost double the size of the existing studios. 36 will be social rented affordable housing, and the additional 24 will be intermediate rent. All 60 of these exemplar homes will be for women living or working in this borough, with 50% directly from the council's housing list. So our work with HUB for four years has given us both assurance and confidence that this partnership will deliver on Women's Pioneers' strong commitment and legacy of providing safe and secure homes and an environment where single women can thrive. Indeed, many letters of support have come from our residents who see how incredibly important this development is for other single women. So delivering this proposal through a trusted and committed partnership not only increases the affordable housing in Hammersmith and Fulham, keeping more single women safe, it also allows us to keep our headquarters within the borough. So if I hand over to Damon and explain a bit more about the co-living proposal. Thank you, Tracy. We are thankful for the opportunity to speak in front of you all again and address some of the questions raised at the last committee. I would like to clarify some of the points on the standard of accommodation. We understood from the discussions last time that this was focused on a co-living element of the scheme. Co-living is a form of shared living that is made up of private individual rooms and communal spaces and facilities. Co-living differs from traditional residential C3 use because there is a clear emphasis on the communal living element, which research, research proves combats loneliness and addresses isolation. At HUB, we always build buildings that stand the test of time. So prior to commencing this development, we undertook a significant amount of research into co-living and visited established developments operating today, including in Scandinavia, which is the market leader for this form of living. We believe the scheme, if approved, will provide the exemplar co-living development in the UK and a new benchmark for future co-living developments. To date, HUB have designed and built 2,466 homes across Greater London. Our business takes great pride in delivering and managing well-designed developments that our tenants are proud to call home. We care about every one of our tenants and our neighbours greatly, which has given us the reputation of one of the most trusted development partners in the UK rental space. As you have heard, we have worked with our project team over the last couple of weeks to ensure more than adequate storage space is provided in the communal kitchens. We've added PVs onto the roof to improve the carbon reduction, allocated space for e-bikes and scooters in the lower ground floor, and reduced the peak lift waiting time from 50 to 45 seconds to improve residents' experience. There will be a 24-7 concierge and a maintenance team that undertake a range of tasks from regular maintenance and repairs, cleaning the kitchens, closing the roof terraces in the evening, to organising residents' community events. It will be the on-site team's responsibility to ensure the safety and security of the residents is maintained at all times. Prospective tenants will undergo reference checks, which includes identification and criminal offences. Additionally, they would have to sign up to a code of conduct for the development in order to lease a home. These measures seek to ensure that the tenants are safe and respect the development. I would like to reiterate how successful we've been working with offices and the community over the last four years to prepare and design this scheme that provides a new office for women's pioneer housing, much needed affordable homes, and five million pounds worth of section 106 financial obligations that will benefit this part of Hammersmith and Fulham if the application is approved tonight. We remain committed to working with women's pioneer housing to deliver this scheme so if a decision isn't made this evening, we will review options for pursuing this application, which would include the need to reappraise the scheme and associated benefits given the turbulent economic outlook. 
We would therefore urge members to approve this unique development opportunity this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tracy and Damien. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move to committee members' questions to officers. Who would like to start with the questioning? Councillor Walsh. Thank you, Chair. Um, my first question is regarding the, uh, the addition of PVs to this development. Uh, can officers advise how they're going to be, how the PVs will be utilised in this development? Yes, the, the PVs will be used for, for both um, heating and cooling um, um, in terms of the, uh, the accommodation within the co-living building. Thank you. Um, my next question is obviously uh, in regarding to the provision of uh, bike storage, which is something that I had brought up the last time. Um, I am obviously very pleased to see that there has been this provision, as it does definitely improve the safety of a tall building um, and, of course, still continues people to use greener forms of transport. Um, could you tell me about the, the charging? Is it going to be um, just uh, plugs or is there some sort of like charging units being installed? Sorry. I don't have specific details on, on the type of um, 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 charging systems within, within the room. Um, Obviously, they are. There'll be availability to charge a number of uh, scooters at one time. So I, I would assume that they, they, um, they are sort of sort of a plug-in system. Um, the only indication is that um, obviously they are. They will be within a uh, within a secure a fire rated enclosed space. Thank you. And my last question is. Uh, just regarding the provisions in uh, the accommodation. So on page 67, it does talk about the additional uh, cooking facilities for residents in individual rooms. Um, and obviously you've mentioned in your presentation about the provision of uh, microwaves. Would I be correct in saying that this will improve the, the functionality of the building? Obviously at the last committee meeting, one of the issues that we uh, discussed was at meal times the traffic through the building as people made their way down to the seventh floor. Is this, in your educated opinion, likely to um, mitigate that concern? I think I think this is obviously one one of the elements that needs to be considered here. Obviously, in terms in terms of the provisions within the room. Um, the, the, the provision already includes a, a small kitchen area um, with the induction hob. The applicants have gone now one step further and included the mi a microwave uh, facilities. So if in an individual wants to stay and cook in their room, they obviously have that option. Within the communal areas, there's a wide range of cooking facilities, um, which will be provided in terms of obviously providing quick um, quick meals to obviously uh, providing full um, cooking facilities. So I think overall there's quite a, a wide uh, arrangement and availability of different cooking facilities provided in terms of whether or not they want to cook individually in their own room or within the communal space or share, share, share these facilities with other residents. Thank you. Councillor Harcourt? Yeah, actually, just before I come to Councillor Harcourt, just for the member of the audience, unfortunately, registered speakers have to be registered in advance, so there's no opportunity to, to make comments this evening. I apologise. Councillor Harcourt. Thank you, Chair. Um, not so many questions, but more, more comments, I suppose, really, on my part. Beginning with the issue about the, the tower and the height of the tower and whether it's in the you know, designated area for tall buildings or, or not. Um, which is what we discussed last time. It is outside the designated area, and I've heard what's been said about this Hillingdon judgment and whether this is, it should be treated as a gateway. But my concern is, as, as officers have mentioned, that we've got the Stanhope development further down, um, whatever it's called, White, uh, White City East, or whatever it's called, the building, 20 something stories over there. On the other side of the road, you've got St. James's development going up to 20, 30 stories. 
Imperial area is uh, just south of Westway is blank at the moment, but that's going to be tall buildings. On the north side of Westway, you've got Imperial with that uh, uh, great ziggurat over there. And my problem with this isn't so much whether it's gateway or not, or whether it's inside or out, it's this creeping development upward lane of tall buildings. And I think that point still stands um, even now. Um, I'm glad to see the, about what's been done with the, adding the photovoltaics to the roof and a number of other issues as well. But um, there are a number of other concerns still, which I think are still there. And while there's uh, mention of 24-7 uh, concierge and uh, such like, uh, one of the areas that uh, is of concern is that green area to the north of the development, which is actually part of the Clarion housing. And uh, let's not forget those other buildings around there, the, uh, the Cavell House, uh, Nightingale House, Pankhurst House, um, Christie House and Pioneer Way. These are all uh, properties that are originally entirely for, for women. More recently, there's been a number of men allowed in their mixed accommodation and problems have arisen as a result of that and I appreciate what's being said by the uh, two speakers about safety and safety for women and the affordable housing for single women is absolutely essential and I, I do applaud the provision of that don't get me wrong on that one but at the same time introducing a mixed uh, gender development in that area with that green which has been an area of contention for some while in terms of the potential for antisocial behaviour and such like, I think is something that still needs to uh, to be considered, especially, and even if, uh, you know, you may say that uh, the new residents are going to be vetted, they're going to be uh, checked in terms of any um, um, convictions and such like. Uh, Given this recent situation, it's understandable for some women, and many of these women are elderly, they've been there in these properties for ages. It's quite understandable that they're going to be quite worried about this sudden change in uh, the area where, where they live. So there's that. Um, then on top of that, um, Um, the other thing that was mentioned, um, and it's not something that necessarily has come up here, uh, but I did ask last time about uh, the um, viability of the model of co-living. And I, it is a relatively new model, although there has been no uh, property in Ealing, uh, which I won't mention, but it has recently undergone sort of difficulties. Uh, whether that's management or whether that's the model beginning to fail is unclear. So, I'm, you know, I have some still have some questions around that. And um, I also sit, as I said before, I sit on the uh, OPDC, the Old Open Park Royal Development Corporation Planning Committee, and there have been other applications for um, co-living. And one of the things that came up each time was this provision of where the shared services are. And having them all on one floor is always seen as a bit of an issue, especially given the problems we've all experienced recently with COVID. God forbid that we end up with another lockdown or another wave of uh, an infection like that, whether it be COVID or something similar. But ending up with everybody using that shared area, and I appreciate what's been done in terms of providing microwaves, but uh, not Nonetheless, you know, having those facilities spread out over the uh, area, which is, I think, as much the point that was being made uh, last time about um, the um, stand of, of accommodation as, as well. So, but, you know, as I still have a lot of uh, concerns about this. And the, the points I'm making are points that have come to me from people I've heard and spoken to, because I do represent this board and have done for some years. And I'm in regular contact with a number of the uh, residents and the residence groups over there. And this is the feedback that's come uh, uh, to me. So those are the concerns that I have about that. I'm afraid they still stand. Although having said that, I really do welcome the, you know, the work that Women's Pioneer have done in terms of providing safe accommodation for single women. Thank you, Councillor Harcourt. Um, I'll go to Councillor Carmel and then I'll come to Councillor Chavot Verdier. Thank you. More, more of a, a, a relatively brief comment rather than anything else. And uh, I'm sure that the Damascene conversion of some, some members of this committee we will see has got nothing to do with any whipping being imposed, but that is, I'll leave it there. Um, 
We had enough information at the last committee to make a decision. We spent a considerable amount of time doing it. We had the officers to answer that question. We made the decision. I will not be taking part in tonight and I will abstain. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Carmel. Um, just to make clear for members of the public that the reasons for this um, application coming back at this meeting are, are laid out in the agenda. So I would encourage all members of the public to, to look there for the reasons. Uh, Councillor Chabot Verdier. Thank you, Chair. Uh, officers, questions for you. You've brought forward two uh, extra policy considerations um, for us to, to consider, and I agree with the Chair and what's been said and the reasons for bringing it back to this committee. Um, about the Gateway East Tower, what is the timeline for construction of that building? Um, uh, currently, at the moment, obviously, they, they have commenced the development within the, the, the relevant time limit. Um, and they're looking to um, um, possibly make some amendments to the scheme um, in, in the new year, but I anticipate if, if those are successful that uh, they would look at starting to commence that development uh, probably towards the end of 2023. Thank you. The um, second question I had was, um, again, um, interesting policy considerations about D9. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us more for us committee members what the decision by the Secretary of State and from whichever government that was to call in the Edith Summer School House um, proposal, what does that mean and what does the outcome mean for us? <coughs> Through the chair, thank you. Uh, that's a reference to uh, uh, an application on the Summer School Estate for a tall building, again, outside of a, of the, of a designated area because the, the London plan obviously is recent, the local plan less so, so we hadn't actually got designated areas other than regen areas. In that particular case, the application got called in by the Secretary of State. So there was a public inquiry to address the concerns by those who had advocated his call in the Secretary of State himself, and they primarily dealt with the tall building issue. And indeed, the mayor's interpretation of his own policy, D9. At that time, we didn't have Hillingdon. So the, the, the process was that we had to address the policy and we, we took advice from the, from the mayor of London's office about it not being gateway. We tried to argue, yes, we acknowledge it, it fails the first point of the, of the policy. But then there's a series of criteria that we looked at in order to try and weigh up the harm. And we rehearsed those arguments with the QC we'd appointed to, to act with us on the public inquiry. So the public inquiry was, was concluded. The QC represented our views about it not being a gateway policy and went through a whole kind of system of, of checks and balances in terms of the harm and the impact on heritage assets in the vicinity. Uh, and, and the argument was that it is, yes, it's harmful, but it's not harmful enough to outweigh the the uh, benefits of it and we were arguing that the actual interpretation of the policy by the other side in effect that if you fail step one that should be enough wasn't yeah. what the policy meant with the backing of the GLA. Our QC agreed with that, the, the inspector subsequently agreed with it in his recommendation to the Secretary of State and the Secretary of State subsequently acting on the inspector's advice granted permission. So that's the kind of that's that's the cause and effect, if you like. In the meantime, between uh, the inspector reporting back to the Secretary of State on the inquiry, the Hillingdon judgment came. Uh, the Hillingdon judgment is, is, is across a range of things, but one of the key issues for us, given what we were doing, is the conclusion that it's not a gateway policy, that you don't stop at the first stage, you have to go th through the remainder, if only to demonstrate or identify the harm and then to weigh that properly up in the balance. So in order to establish, if you like, the conflict with the development plan as a whole, as opposed to that one policy, that was the key takeaway. So those are the two issues. Now, obviously people don't all agree with the, with the Hillingdon decision, but it's, it's a high court decision. So until it's superseded, that is the last word on the interpretation of that policy. And that is what we've 
try to reflect in the addendum report that you need to go through these steps. So we're not we're not trying to argue that it's it's fully compliant. We advertise the application as a departure. What we're trying to say is that we need to then look into it into more detail and establish the extent of the harm so that we can then weigh that up in the context of the development plan policies as a whole, as opposed to that one policy. Thank you. So if I understand correctly, we're looking at judgments by both the High Court and a member of the British government. And this scheme is similar to those to without having to make you go through those in detail but this proposal yeah. sorry is similar to them the process i should say not the schemes this well the schemes of the tall buildings obviously so that, that they've got that in common but it's the process for assessing a tall building that's not identified as being within a uh, an area suitable tall buildings in the in the council's 2018 plan and against d9 because there was a difference of opinion amongst people as to how to interpret D9, those wanted to, wanted to regard it as either, you, you know, as a yes or a no. And we were advocating it's a more complex approach with, with the backing of the mayor, and that's the approach that was then um, sustained and supported by the two decisions that we mentioned. The, the current position, as I said, is that the, the high courts do not believe that it's a, a gateway policy. If that changes in the future, fine, but we're not aware of that, and that is the, that is the you know, it's not an inspector, it, it's more than an inspector, it's the course, that is their view on the wording of that policy at this point in time. Okay, are there any further questions? Councillor Schwab-Verdier. Thank you, on a different topic, I wanted to ask, so um, you said that all the private rooms and the proposal are compliant in terms of um, overheating, so I was interested in knowing what policy they comply with and essentially not being a climate change expert or a heating expert, does that mean that we're not going to see each residence buy a uh, air conditioning unit to compensate for overheating in, in their rooms? Uh, no, that's not the intention. Uh, obviously, the, 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 the consideration has been given to London Plan Policy SI4 in terms of, uh, in terms of the overheating considerations and uh, each each um each of the occupants in terms of individual rooms plus obviously the communal areas will be serviced by a communal communal uh, facility which will provide tempered air through through the system um which will obviously provide cooling and uh, cooling so to prevent overheating in those summer months Thank you very much for that. I also wanted to talk about the solar panels. Um, is the 17th floor, was that going to be a terrace space in the first place? No, the, 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 that's always been the plant area. So the, it's the 16th floor is the terrace area, which is the communal, uh, there's the, the additional communal floor on the 16th level. Level 17 is actually the plant area. So within Within the design of that uh, plant area, effectively, it's, it's almost like a crown. So it's almost like a double height uh, feature on, on the top of the building. So there, there, is, there, was, there is space and capacity to provide the PV panels within that enclosure, as shown in the uh, section which I um, provided in the presentation. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful, thank you. Unless you wanted to show it on screen, sorry. It's, it's um, so obviously this is an image of the, um, the the upper floors level 16 across here, and this is the plant area at level 17. Um, and this is a section which shows how the PVs could be incorporated at that level um, within within the overall height of that enclosure. Thank you. And, and about those PVs, could you tell us roughly? what they mean for the sustainability of the building. Because there was this number you talked about, it was 25%, 53%, so... Yeah, so... Um, can't be confused about that. Yeah, what it means for the overall development is actually an, an improvement in terms of the carbon offset um, and an overall improvement in terms of the performance of the development in terms of energy, the energy strategy by 1%. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and very quickly, I wanted to move on um, to two, two things about vision of um, amenities, etc., and communal spaces. Um, there was talk about a microwave oven, and forgive me if it's a misunderstanding on my part, is that just a microwave or also an oven? Okay. And each resident will be provided with an individual lockable space on level seven. Does that include a fridge? And how big will that space be? Now, within each individual room, you have, uh, in addition to the kitchenette, you have a, a, a fridge um, within the individual room, but there'll also be um, additional uh, fridge and um, storage facilities within the communal areas as well. And how big will the lockable space be in, in the common area that will be provided to each residence, roughly? Or uh, I don't have the specific size areas. All I know is that they'll either be at the, the base of the units, obviously um, where the, the worktop is, or on within um, sort of um, cupboards and shelves on, on the upper levels. Thank you. Uh, is that a, a fridge freezer in each room? Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, are there any further questions? No, okay, if there are no further questions, then we will move on to voting uh, on whether recommendation one in the report is agreed. That's on agenda page 73, paragraph 4.2. I will read it out. That subject to there being no contrary direction from the Mayor of London, the Chief Planning Officer be authorised to grant planning permission upon the completion of a satisfactory legal agreement and subject to the conditions listed below. Councillor Chavot Berdier, will you be voting for, against, or not voting? For. Councillor Harcourt. Against. Councillor Suslis. For. Councillor Walsh. For. Uh, Councillor Pascal Tibure. Yes. And I'll be voting for. So recommendation one has. Councillor Carmel, I believe you. Not you... voting. Not like voting. I formally have to do okay. it. Okay, oh, I apologise. Councillor Carmel, not voting. Okay. Uh, so I vote for. So the recommendation one has been agreed. Uh, now we move on to recommendation two which is that the Chief Planning Officer, after consultation with the Assistant Director, Legal Services, and the Chair of the Planning and Development Control Committee, be authorised to make any minor changes to the proposed heads of terms of the legal agreement or proposed conditions, which may include the variation, addition, or deletion of conditions. Any such changes shall be within their discretion. Councillor Chavot Verdier. For. Councillor Harcourt. Against. Councillor Suslis. For. Councillor Walsh. For. Councillor Carmel. Councillor Pascal Tiburé. And I'll be voting for. So that application has been approved. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your time and for tuning in. Um, I'd like to thank everyone also for attending here in person. The draft minutes of this meeting will be published on our website shortly. These will be formally approved at our next meeting on the 6th of December, 2022. And if you have any queries concerning the applications in the meantime, please contact the case officer in the application report. Thank you very much. Good night.